Chapter 2, The Theory of Value. Preliminary Remarks. It has been shown in the preceding chapter that ancient writers for 1300 years unanimously held that exchangeability is the sole essence and principle of wealth, and that whatever can be bought and sold or exchanged, or whose value can be measured in money, is wealth, whatever its form or its nature may be. The ancients also showed that there are three distinct orders of quantities whose value can be measured in money. 1. Material things. 2. Personal qualities, both in the forms of labor and credit. 3. Abstract rights. After centuries of controversy, modern writers have at length come to the same conclusion as the ancients. And it is a matter of positive knowledge that there is nothing beyond these three orders of quantities whose value can be measured in money. The science is now complete. Consequently, having generalized all our fundamental concepts so as to grasp, grasp all these three orders of quantities, by the laws of inductive logic, we are sure that our concepts cannot be overthrown or modified. We are sure that our concepts Oh, yep, cannot be overthrown or modified. It has only been shown that the value of any economic quantity is of other economic quantity for which it can be exchanged. Hence, the theory of value is the investigation of the laws which govern the relations of these exchangeable quantities. The complete theory of value comprehends one, the definition of value, Number two, the origins, the origin, cause, or form of value. Three, the general law of value, or the general equation of economics. On each of these three subjects, there has been an immense amount of controversy, which we have chiefly disposed of in the introduction, so that we have endeavored to reduce it to a minimum in the present chapter. Section one, the definition of value. One. Value, in its original sense, is a desire or affection of the mind towards some object. It means esteem or estimation. As Gloucester says in Lear, in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the dukes he values most. So in Troilus, so Troilus in Troilus and Crescenda for, says, for what is ought but as tis valued. So Henry Esmond says, there is some particular prize we all of us value, and that every man of spirit will venture his life for. So J.B. Say says, value is a moral quality. Now, a person may value a friend very highly, or he may value some object in his possession very highly, or he may desire to obtain something which is in someone else's possession very much. But as economics or commerce is the science of exchanges, such value does not enter into economics. To bring value into economics, a person must not only have an estimate of some object or property of his own, but he must have a desire or value for something which is in someone else's possession and be willing to give some of his own property in exchange for it. One person, however, cannot acquire an object which another person possesses without giving him in exchange for it some object which that other person desires, demands, and values. Hence, economic value evidently requires the, the occurrence of two minds. If a person brought a cargo of tobacco to a nation of non-smokers, it would have no value among them because no person would desire it. If a person brought a cargo of wine to a nation of teetotalers, it would have no value because no one would desire it and therefore no one would buy it. It would be vain for farmers to breed cattle or herds among a nation of vegetarians because no one would desire them. There would be no demand for them and therefore no one would buy them. However, much a person may wish to sell his product. He cannot do so unless someone else will buy it, and in that case, it would have no economic value. Hence, for an exchange to take place, there must be the reciprocal desire or demand of two persons, each for the product of the other. When, however, two persons each desire or demand to obtain the product of the other, and when they have agreed as to the quantity of their own product, which they will 
give in exchange to acquire the product of the other, each product may be considered the measure of the desire of its owner to obtain the product of the other. The two products, therefore, measure the desire, demand, or value of their respective owners to obtain the product of the other. And when two persons have agreed upon the quantities of their products to be exchanged, the products are said to be of equal value. Each product is the value or the demand for the other, and this is the only kind of value with which economics is concerned. Hence, in every phenomenon of economic value or exchange, there are two demands and two quantities, and it is evident that the true origin or cause of value is reciprocal demand. Thus, let A and B be any two economic quantities, which are exchanged at any instant. Then we, then we may say A valet B, or A is of the value of B, or A equals B. Then B is the value of A in terms of B, and A is the value of B in terms of A. Thus, Aristotle says, Nico, ethos, the term value is used in reference to external things. So it is said in Roman law, the value of a thing is what it can be sold for. The Greek word for value is, which is, is I can't say that Greek word, which is derived from another Greek word, one of whose meaning is to weigh or be of the weight of. Thus, Desmothenus, speaking of some golden goblet, says, each one weighing emina. And he says of the sword of Mardonius, which weighed 300 derricks. So Homer, Iliad 23, page 885 says, and he offered to, as a prize, a new cauldron or ornamented with flowers worth an ox. Hence, asiae, or the Greek word, means equality, weight for weight, as when two quantities placed in a balance are of equal weight. So in Latin, Estimatio means exactly the same as exaio. It means the quantity of money given for anything. Thus, Cicero speaks of estimatio frugamenti, the value of the corn to be furnished. So Caesar speaks of estimatio possessonum et re rum, the value of their goods and chattels. So Catalus says, 12, come 11, which does not affect me on account of its value. So the value was also expressed by ponderer and pender to weigh. So Morocco says in the Merchant of Venice, pause there, Morocco, and weigh thy value with an even hand. So in 4, comma 1, Portia warns Shylock, if the scale do turn, but in the estimation of a hair, i.e. by the weight of a hair. So Latrosny says that value is a new quality, which products acquire when men live in society. Products acquire then in the social state, which arises from the community of men among each other, a new quality. This new quality is value, which makes products become wealth. Wealth consists in the ratio of exchange, which takes place between such and such a product, between such a, a quantity of one product and such a quantity of another product. Price is the expression of value. It is not separate in exchange. Each thing is reciprocally the price of the merchandise. In a sale, the price is in money. Hence, it is clear that value is a ratio or an equation, like distance and an equation it necessarily requires two objects. The value of anything is always something external to itself. Hence, a single object cannot have economic value. A single object cannot be equal or distant. If an object is said to be equal or distant, we must ask equal to what? Distant from what? So if any quantity is said to have value, we must ask value and what? And as it is absurd to speak of absolute or intrinsic equality or absolute or intrinsic distance, so it is equally absurd to speak of absolute or intrinsic value. It is impossible to predicate that any quantity has value without at the same time implying that it can be exchanged for something else. And of course, every thing it can be exchanged for 
is its value in that commodity. Hence, any economic quantity has as many values as quantities it can be exchanged for. And if it can be exchanged for nothing, it has no value. Examples of value, number two. Any economic quantity may have value in terms of any other. Suppose that A, as above, is 10 guineas. Then B may be any one of the other three species of economic quantities. It may be a watch, or so much corn, or wine, or clothes, or any other material chattel. Or it may be so much labor, instruction, or amusement. Or it may be a right of action, or a debt, or the funds, or a copyright, or shares in a commercial company, or any other abstract right. Each of these species of property is of the value of 10 guineas, and therefore it follows that each of them is equal in value to the others, because things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. The value of money in the pockets of the public is the product, services, and rights it can purchase. The value of the goods in the warehouses of merchants and traders is the money in the pockets of the public. The value of an incorporeal right is the thing promised which may be demanded. The value of a five pound note is five sovereigns. The value of a postage stamp is the carriage of a letter. The value of a railway ticket is the journey. The value of an order to see the play is seeing the play. The value of a promise to cut a man's hair is cutting his hair. The value of an order for milk, bread, wine, soup, coals, etc. is the milk, bread, etc. If I want a loaf of bread which costs the shilling, what difference does it make to me whether I have a shilling or the promise of the baker to give me a loaf? It is clear that in this case, the shilling and the promise are exactly of the same value to me. Suppose that the price of cutting one's hair is a shilling. What difference does it make to me whether I have a shilling or the promise of the hairdresser to cut my hair? In this case, it is clear that the shilling and the promise are of exactly equal value to me. In short, in the case of every product and service, the money to purchase it with and a promise to render the product or service are of exactly equal value in each separate case. Each separate tradesman, of course, only promises to tender one particular service or product. And as the product or service is not demandable from anyone else, each promise has only particular value. And as, e and as that person may become bankrupt or die, the promise has only precarious value. Now, what is money by the unanimous consent of economics? By the unanimous consent of economists, it is nothing but a general right or title to demand any of these products or services at any time. And as there is always some person who can render them, if not, if another cannot. Money has general and permanent value, while each of these promises has only particular or precarious value. Each of these separate rights, then, is of exactly the same nature as money, but it is not of an inferior degree. But they are, each of them, economic quantities or wealth for the very same reason that money is. Is it not clear that if a person had his pockets full of promises by solvent persons to render him, all the products and services he might acquire, he would be exactly as wealthy as if he had so much money. And if he can always sell or exchange any of these orders for orders for a different thing, just as he could material chattels. Hence, we see the perfect justice of the doctrine of all jurists that rights are wealth. On negative values, number three. Value then, being the desire or affection of the mind towards certain objects may be of two forms either the desire to acquire something or the desire to get rid of something. As these desires are inverse and opposite to each other, they may be denoted by opposite signs. And if the desire to obtain something may be termed positive value, the desire to get rid of something may be termed negative value. Thus, if we consider a piece of land just in the fit state to be cultivated and produce crops to be in the state zero, it may be covered with prime primeval forest with marshes and fens, with boulders or any other, any obstructions to cultivation. It may require a considerable sum of money to clear away 
all the obstructions and place it in a fit state for cultivation, which we have denoted by zero. The sum necessary to clear away these obstructions and bring it to the state zero may be termed its negative value. And so, if it be intended to build a street of improved houses, the ground, when it is fit to be built upon, may be denoted by zero, but it may be covered with old buildings, which it is necessary to remove before it is fit to be built upon. The sum necessary to be spent to remove these old buildings and prepare it for the erection of the new ones may be termed its negative value. So if the state of a person in health be denoted by zero, be denoted by zero, he may fall into illness and require the services of a physician to bring him into a state of health. Now, as the foes paid to, now as the fees paid to the physician are paid for removing an obstruction in health, they may be termed a negative value. If all people were perfectly honest and never invaded the rights of other people, a very large portion of the fees paid to, to advocates would be saved. If we consider the state of a person in possession of his rights to be zero, all the sums expended in defending, maintaining, and removing rights might be saved. And as these sums are spent in removing obstructions to the enjoyment of rights, they may be termed a negative value. If we consider persons in the enjoyment of perfect security as to their persons and property as zero, and if people were perfectly honest and never attacked their neighbors' persons and, and property, there would be no use for the police, hence all the sums spent on the police, which are spent merely for the purpose of warding off injuries to person and property, may be termed a negative value. If the reign of universal peace had come, and nations did not attack one another, the enormous armaments by sea and land, which weigh down the population and finances of all European nations might be saved. So all the sums spent by European nations on their fleets and armies are negative values. So many other instances of negative value might be adduced. Now it is evident that all the sums spent on negative values So if we consider, oops, oh, yeah, if we consider persons in the enjoyment of perfect security as to their persons and property as zero, oh, yep, already did that paragraph. Okay, if the reign of universal peace had come and nations did not attack one another, the enormous armaments by sea and land, which weighed down the population and finances of all European nations might be saved. So all the sums spent by European nations on their fleets and armies are negative values. <coughs> so many other instances of negative value might be adduced. Now it is evident that all the sums spent on negative values or on removing obstructions or um, are just so much subtracted from positive values or the acquirement of enjoyments. We thus see what a gigantic obstruction to progress and wealth are these European armaments, and what an immense advantage in the progress of wealth it is to America to be free from them. It was the observation that there are two kinds of value, positive value and negative value, to which we first drew attention, which led Stanley Javons, as he acknowledged, to designate political economy by the somewhat fantastic title as the calculus of pleasure and pain. There may be a general rise or fall of prices, but not of values. Number four, price is the value of any economic quantity in money or credit. Now, if money or credit be very greatly Increased or decreased in quantity, the prices of all other economic quantities may rise or fall, but they will still preserve their relations amongst themselves. If a loaf of bread and a pound of meat each cost a shilling, and if, in consequence of a great increase in the quantity of money in credit, they each rise to two shillings, 
or if in consequence of a great diminution in the quantity of money and credit, they each fall to sixpence. The loaf of bread is still of the value of a pound of meat. Hence, there may be a general rise or a general fall of prices. But there can be no such thing as a general rise or a general fall of values. Everything can no more rise or fall with respect to everything else than, as Mill says, a dozen runners can each outrun the rest, or a hundred trees can overtop each other. To suppose that all things could rise relatively to each other would be to realize Pat's idea of society, where everyone is as good as his neighbor, and a great deal better too. The opposite case of everything falling in value to everything else would be analogous to everyone thinking himself inferior to everyone else, which according to human nature would be an impossible case. Nothing can have fixed value unless everything has fixed value. Number five, as value is the ratio in which any two quantities will exchange, it is clear that the value of A in terms of B varies directly as, varies directly as B. That is, if it increases or decreases according to the greater or less quantity of B that A can purchase. And the value of B in terms of A varies directly as A. That is, it increases or decreases according as B can purchase more or less of A. It is also clear that if from any cause whatever, the value or ratio between A and B has changed, the value of both of them has changed. It is manifestly as observed to say that the value of A has changed with respect to B, but the value of B has remained the same with respect to A, as it would be to say that a railway station has remained at the same distance from a train while the train has increased its distance from the station. Moreover, it is as absurd to say that a quantity has changed its own value or kept its own value fixed without stating the quantity with respect to which its value has changed or remained fixed, as it would be to say that an object has changed or preserved its distance or ratio fixed without saying its distance from what or its ratio to what. Hence, it is clear that nothing can have a fixed or invariable value unless everything else is fixed and invariable in value as well. Because though a quantity may retain its value unchanged with respect to a certain number of quantities, yet if its value has changed with respect to any other quantities, its value has changed. On the origin, source, or cause of value. Number six. We now come to the second branch of our inquiry. What is the origin, source, or cause of value? Or in the language of Bacon, what is the form of value? And whence does it originate? Now, when we are to search for the cause of value, it is necessary to understand what we are searching for. There are three distinct orders of quantities, each containing many varieties, which all have value. We have to discover some single cause which is common to them all and ascertain what that single cause is by genuine induction. Bacon says, but the induction which is to be available for the discovery and demonstration of sciences and arts must analyze nature by proper rejections and exclusions. And then after a sufficient number of negatives, come to a conclusion on the affirmative instances and also what the sciences stand in need of is a form of induction, which shall analyze experience and take it to pieces, and by a due process of exclusion and rejection lead to an inevitable conclusion. The first step in this process of induction is to make a complete collection of all the different kinds of quantities, of whatever nature they may be, which have value. For whoever is acquainted with forms, i.e. causes, embraces the unity of nature in substances the most unlike. From the discovery of forms, causes, results, results truth in theory and freedom in practice. Bacon earnestly inculcates as the foundation of all 
true sciences, a careful collection of all kinds of instances in which the given nature is found. The investigation of forms precedes this. Nature, such as value, being given, we must first of all have a presentation for the understanding of all known instances which agree in the same nature, though in substances the most unlike. And such collection must be made in the manner of history without premature speculation. Bacon then exemplifies his method by an investigation into the form of heat. He gives tables of the diverse instances agreeing in the nature of heat, also where it appears in different degrees. The work and office of these tables I call the presentation of instances to the understanding, which presentation having been made, induction itself must be set to work. For the problem is upon a review of the instances, all and each, to find such a nature as is always present or absent with the given nature, and always increases or decreases with it, and which is, as I have said, a particular case of a more general nature. We must therefore make a complete solution and separation of nature, not indeed by fire, but by the mind, which is a kind of divine fire. The first work, therefore, of true induction, so far as the discovery of causes, is the rejection or, or exclusion of the several natures, which are not found in some instances, where the given nature is present, and are found in some instances where the given nature is absent, and are found to increase in some instances where the given nature decreases, or to decrease where the given nature increases. Then indeed, after the rejection and inclusion has been duly made, there will remain at the bottom all light opinions vanishing in smoke. A cause affirmative, solid and true and well defined. An indispensable part of induction is the rejection of erroneous causes. I must now give an example of the exclusion and rejection of natures, which by the table of presentations are found not to belong to the form of value. Observing in the meantime, not only each table suffices for the rejection of any nature, but even any one of the particular instances contained in any of the tables. For it is manifest from what has been said that any one contradictory instance overthrows a conjecture as to the cause. Investigation of the form or cause of value. Number seven. Bacon has exemplified his process of induction by investigating the form or cause of heat. Our present task is to investigate the form or cause of value. Following the example of the mighty master, we must begin by making a complete collection of all the instances of value. That is, we must enumerate all the different kinds of quantities with all their varieties, which have value. These are one, corporal or material quantities. Under this species are comprehended the following varieties lands, houses, trees, cattle, flocks and herds of all sorts, corn and uh, all other fruits of the earth, furniture, clothes, money, minerals of all sorts, money, jewelry of all sorts, pearls, manufactured articles of all sorts, fish. Two, immaterial quantities, comprehending labor of all sorts, agricultural, artisan, professional, scientific, literary. Three, incorporal quantities, Comprehending rights of action, credits or debts, the funds, copyrights, patents, shares in commercial companies, the goodwill of a business, a professional practice, tolls, ferries, tithes, ad valsens, ground rents, shootings, fishings, market rents. We must now investigate the cause of value of all these different kinds of quantities and in each one separately. We must first, by a due and systematic course of rejections and exclusions, eliminate all accidental and intrusive ideas which may in some cases be associated with value and in others not. 
And after completing this course of rejection and exclusion, we must end by an affirmative and discover that single general cause, which is common to all these different classes of quantities, which being present, value is present, which being absent, value is absent, which when it increases, value increases, which when it decreases, value decreases. Material, materiality is not necessary to value, number eight. Now in, now, in examining the three classes of quantities, which all have value, we observe that the whole class of immaterial quantities and the whole class of incorporeal quantities have value, but have no materiality. Hence, it is evident that materiality is not necessary to value. It is only in some cases the accident of value. Durability is not necessary to value. Number nine, we also observe that some things which have value last forever, like the land, the funds, shares in commercial companies, precious stones. Other things may last a very long time, such as houses, watches, pictures. Other things have a much less degree of durability, such as clothes, animals, etc. Others have a very short degree of durability, such as food, flowers, etc. But labor, which in many cases has very high value, perishes in the instant of its production and therefore has no durability or permanence at all. Thus, quantities which have value have all degrees of permanence or durability. Now, among Bacon's prerogative instances, he mentions ultimately, ultimity or limit and says, nor should extremes in the lowest degree be less noticed than instances in the highest degree. This is the doctrine of the law of continuity, which says that which is true up to the limit is true at the limit. From these principles, it follows that things which have the lowest degree of permanence or durability, which is zero, are to be included in economics, as well as those which have the highest degree. Hence, it is seen that permanence or durability is not necessary to value. It is only the accident of value. Error of the doctrine that labor is the cause of value. 10. Having shown that materiality and permanence are in no way necessary to value, but are only its accidents in some cases, we have now to discover the cause of value, a doctrine which has obtained great hold over English economics. A doctrine which has obtained great hold over English economics is that labor is the cause of value. Now, if we simply refer to the table of instances given above, it will be seen at once that there are multitudes of instances of value in which there is no labor at all. And this at once shows that labor is in no way essential to value, but only accidentally associated with it in some cases. Nevertheless, this fatal doctrine has obtained such a firm hold and has had such a baleful influence over English economics and has so especially prevented the true apprehension of the principles of credit that we must give a more elaborate refutation of it. The doctrine that labor is the cause of all value, which is entirely peculiar to English economics originated as far as we are aware with Locke. As this passage is but very little known, we shall make room for it, though rather long. After alleging that the foundation of the right of appropriating portions of the earth and its products by private persons originated in the labor they bestowed on them, he says, nor is it so strange as perhaps it might appear that the property of labor should overbalance the community of land. For it is labor indeed that puts the difference of value upon everything, and let anyone Consider what the difference is between an acre of land planted with tobacco and sugar, sown with wheat and barley, and an acre of the same land lying in common, without any husbandry upon it, and he will find that the improvement of labor makes the far greater part of the value. I think it will be but a very modest computation to say that of the products of the earth useful to the life of man, nine-tenths are the effects of labor." Nay, if we will rightly estimate things as they come to our use and cast up the several expenses about them, 
what in them is purely owing to nature and what to labor, we shall find that in most of them, 99 hundredths are wholly to be put on the account of labor. There cannot be a clearer demonstration of anything than several nations of the Americans are aware of this, who are rich in land and poor in all the comforts of life, whom nature having furnished as liberally as any other person with the materials of plenty, i.e. a fruitful soil apt to produce an abundance, what might serve for food, raiment and delight. Yet for want of improving it by labor, have one, have not one hundredth part of the conveniences we enjoy, and a being of a large and fruitful territory, their feats, lodges, and is clad worse than a day laborer in England. To make this a little clearer, let us but trace some of the ordinary provisions of life through their several progresses before they come to our use and see how much of their value they receive from human industry. Bread, wine, and cloth are things of daily use and great plenty, yet notwithstanding acorns, water, and leaves, or clothing or skins, must be our bread, drink, and clothing. Did not labor furnish us with these more useful commodities? For whatever bread is more than acorns, wine than water, and cloth or silk than leaves, skins or moss, that is wholly owing to labor and industry. The one of these being the food and raiment which unassisted nature furnishes us with, the other provisions which our industry and pains prepare for us which how much they exceed the other in value. When any one hath computed, he will then see how much labor makes far the greater part of the value of things we enjoy in this world. And the ground which produces the materials is scarce to be reckoned on as any, or at most, a very small part of it, so little that even among us, land that is left holy to nature, that hath no improvement of pasturage, tillage, or planting is called, as indeed it is, waste, and we shall find the benefit of it amount to little more than nothing. An acre of land that bears here 20 bushels of wheat, and another in America, which with the same husbandry would do the like, are without doubt of the same natural intrinsic value. But yet the best but yet the benefit mankind receives from the one in a year is worth five pounds and from the other probably worth a penny. If all the profit an Indian received from it were to be valued and sold here, at least I may truly say not one thousandth. It is labor then, which puts the greatest part of the value on land without which it would scarcely be worth anything. It is to that we owe the greatest part of all its useful products. For all that the straw, bran, bread of that acre of wheat is worth more than the product, as uh, more than the product of as good land which lays waste, is all the effect of labor. For it is not barely the plowman's pains, the reaper's and the thresher's toils, and the baker's sweat is to be counted in the bread we eat. The labor of these broke the oxen, who digged and wrought the iron and stones, who felled and framed the timber employed about the plow, mill, oven, or any other utensils, which are a vast number requisite to this corn, from its being seed to be sown, to its being made bread, must all be charged on the account of labor, and received as an effect of that. Nature and the earth furnished only the almost worthless materials as in themselves. It would be a strange catalog of things that industry provided and made use of about every loaf of bread before it came into our use. If we could trace them, iron, wood, leather, bark, timber, stone, brick, coals, lime, cloth, dyeing, drugs, pitch, tar, masts, ropes, and the materials made use of in the ship that brought any of the commodities used by any of the workmen to any part of the work, all which it would be impossible, at least too long to reckon up. We have given this 
extract at length because it is probably the most elaborate economical analysis of price of its time. And so far as we are aware, was the first assertion that value is due to human labor. The doctrine of all wealth is the produce of land and labor. The doctrine of all wealth is the produce of land and labor. Of land and labor became very common among the early thinkers on economics from their great ignorance of jurisprudence and practical business. The economists restricted the term wealth to the material products of the earth, which are brought into commerce and exchanged. Hence, according to this doctrine, labor and materiality were indispensably associated with value, but they are not the cause of value, because unless these material products were exchanged, they had no value. Hence, the economists made exchangeability or demand the cause of value. Adam Smith begins his work by designating wealth as the annual produce of land and labor. But as he afterwards enumerates the natural and acquired abilities of the people as wealth. And he also classes banknotes and bills of exchange as circulating capital. He is quite self contradictory, and he afterwards admits that exchangeability is the real essence of value. Ricardo's work is a treatise on value, but he begins by restricting his inquiry to things which are the produce of human labor. And then he says that labor is the foundation of all value, but such a mode of reasoning is evidently inadmissible. McCulloch, who is a mere copyist of Ricardo, also in one place, strenuously maintains that labor is the cause of all value. He says, nature is not niggard nor parsimonious. Her rude products, powers, and capacities are all offered gratuitously to man. She neither demands nor receives an equivalent for her favors, an object which may be appropriated or adopted to our use without any voluntary, without any voluntary labor on our part, may be of the highest utility. But as it is the free gift of nature, it is quite impossible that it can have the slightest value. Also, in its natural state, matter is very rarely possessed of any immediate or direct ability and is always destitute of value. It is only through the labor expended in its apportion. In its natural state, matter is very rarely possessed of any immediate or direct utility and is always destitute of value. It is only through the labor expended in its appropriation and in fitting and preparing it for being used that matter acquires exchangeable value and becomes wealth. We shall afterwards show the absurd consequences of this doctrine and show McCulloch's self-contradictions. So also, Carey, the American economist, was infected with this doctrine and says, labor is the sole cause of all value. Now, it is impossible to stir a step in this subject until this contradiction is cleared up, and we determine whether labor or exchangeability, i.e. demand, is the cause of value. Examination of the doctrine that labor is the cause of value. 11. We have now to apply the principles of the Baconian induction to investigate the doctrine that labor is the sole cause or form of value. We may lay down this lemma. lemma. If labor is the sole cause of value, then whatsoever thing labor has been bestowed upon must have value. For if there be two things produced by the same amount of labor, and the one has value and the other not, then there must be some other cause of value besides labor, which is contrary, contrary to the hypothesis. We will now examine some of the necessary consequences of the doctrine that labor is the cause of all value. One, all differences or variations in value must be due to differences or variations in labor. This, which is Locke's doctrine, is contrary to all experience because there are many material things upon which no labor was ever bestowed, which yet have very great value, and also very great differences of value. The space of ground upon which a city is built has enormous value, but this space of ground is in no way the product of labor. 
Land near the Bank of England has often sold at the rate of two million pounds an acre, quite exclusive of any buildings on it. How is this land the product of labor? As we recede from the center, the value of land rapidly diminishes. At the present time, the value of land at Charing Cross is said to be 600,000 pounds an acre, but in the suburbs of London, it is far less. Moreover, land in the same locality has very different values. A frontage in the main thoroughfare like Cheapside, Fleet Street, Cornhill, Regent Street is of much greater value than an equal space of ground in a back street. How are these differences of value due to differences of labor? When, as we have seen, there never was any labor at all bestowed on the land. Within the last century, immense cities have sprung up in the desert. A hundred years ago, the space of ground on which Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, Chicago, and countless other cities have been built was absolutely worthless. It is now of enormous value. How is its value due to labor? If the augmented value of land is due to increased labor bestowed upon it, a diminution of the land of a diminution of the value of land must be due to labor subtracted from it. But how is this possible? As the tide of fashion, population, and wealth flows towards a locality, the ground rapidly rises in value. Whereas when a locality is deserted by wealth and population, the value of land rapidly diminishes. How are these changes in the value of land due to variations in labor? When, as we have seen, the value of these spaces of ground is not the result of labor at all. The ground in the center of London, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, New York, and countless other cities has enormous value. There are numerous other places now desolate and lonely, which were once the site of great cities. Memphis, Babylon, Nineveh were once great cities. Memphis, Babylon, Nineveh were once great cities. When the chariots and the horsemen were pouring forth in multitudes from the hundred gated Tebs, the land in it had assuredly very great value. So with numberless other places, where is their value now? Yet the ground remains exactly the same as ever it was. Is this diminution in value due to the subtraction of labor? If London, Paris, Berlin, Vienna should ever come to be as Nineveh, Babylon, and Memphis are today, where would the value of the land be? When the future Belizoni or Layard comes from New Zealand to sketch the ruins of St. Paul's from a broken arch of London Bridge to the ground near what was once the Royal Exchange, Will the, will the ground near what was once the Royal Exchange sell for 70 pounds the square foot? When a fair is held near a town, persons pay a good rent for leave to erect booths and tents on the common. Thus, at these times, the land acquires value. At other times, they would pay nothing. Therefore, the simple space of ground has value at one time and not at others. How can the value of the land be due to labor when it remains exactly as it was? McCulloch's doctrine has no natural product, has value before labor, has been bestowed upon it, and that it is the labor of appropriating it, which gives it value, is refuted by the plainest experience. Suppose a person found a fine diamond weighing 400 carats. Would it have no value? And it is the labor of appropriating it, which gives it its value. Suppose another person finds a nugget of gold weighing 400 ounces. Has it no value? And is it the labor of picking it up which gives it its value? The proprietor of a coal mine or a marble quarry demands and receives a price for the coal or the marble as it exists in the mine or the quarry before a human being has touched it. The government founds a new colony and takes possession of the land. It is quite common to demand a price or rent for the land which no person ever touched. How is its value due to labor? In the Midland counties of England, there are many oak trees which would sell for 60 pounds or 100 pounds as they stand upon the ground. There were perhaps self, they were perhaps self-sown. No person perhaps ever bestowed so much labor upon them as to sow the acorn from which they grew. How is the value of such oak trees due to labor? 
but the very same oak trees in the center of a forest in an uninhabited country would have no value at all. How are these differences of value due to labor? It is said that in 1810, an oak tree was cut down at Jalinus in Monmouthshire, whose bark sold for 240 pounds and the wood for 670 pounds. Was this value due to labor? Near these oak trees, there may perhaps be growing other trees, beeches, elms, ashes of the same size. It is well known that these trees do not have the same value as oaks. Are these differences in the value of the different trees due to labor? It is the first resource of gentlemen when embarrassed to sell the timber on their estates. These trees often realize many thousands of pounds. Is their value due to labor? There are again cattle, herds, and flocks of all sorts. They increase and multiply by the agency of nature. How is their value due to labor? Some time ago, a whole whale was stranded on the Firth of Forth. It sold as it lay on the beach for 70 pounds. No human being touched it. How was its value due to labor? Mr. Buckland says, when examining the cast off skins of the snakes at the zoological gardens, we observed some white looking substance in a box. This is the jejecta of the snakes. It is a perfectly white substance looking very like plaster of Paris and is composed of nearly pure uric acid. It is bought by a doctor. I imagine a chemist for the high price of nine shillings a pound is the value of the ex Creta of the snakes due to human labor? Some years ago, when it was the fashion for European ladies to pile huge masses of hair, termed chignons, upon their heads, in imitation of their swarthy sisters of Central Africa, it was not uncommon for a girl's hair to sell for five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, and even sometimes for so high a sum as 50 pounds. Was the value of the girl's hair due to labor? It is stated in a French paper that at Merlin's, in the Department of the Lower Pyrenees, there is a regular market for girls' hair held every second Friday, which is attended by hundreds of hairdressers. Ordinary hair does not go for much, three to 20 francs a head. But for pure white hair, there is an immense demand and it sells for 15 pounds to 20 pounds an ounce. There is no market for ordinary gray hair. Now, is the value of this pure white hair due to human labor? And is the difference in price between ordinary hair and pure white hair due to differences in labor? Two, if labor be the sole cause of value, then all things produced by the same quantity of labor, labor must be equal to value. But this doctrine is contrary to all experience. If it were true, a diamond and the rubbish it is found in ought to be of the same value, so a pearl in its shell ought to be of equal value. If a lump of gold and a lump of clay were obtained by the same quantity of labor, they ought to have the same value. If a sportsman were to shoot a, a peasant, a pheasant bird with one barrel and a crow with the other, they ought to be of the same value. Or if a fisherman were to catch a salmon and a dogfish in the same net, they ought to be of the same value. And similar cases might be multiplied to any extent. Here we have products obtained by exactly the same quantity of labor, some of which have value and others have no value, which decisively proves that labor cannot be the sole cause of value. Three, if labor is the sole cause of value, the value must be proportional to the labor. But this doctrine is contrary to the same, uh, this doctrine is contrary to the most manifest experience. Suppose that a gold digger, by good luck, finds a nugget of gold lying on the surface of the ground. Another digger works for six months and finds an exactly similar one. Another works for a year and finds an exactly similar one, and so on. Then, according to this doctrine, the nugget last found ought to be of immensely greater value than the nugget first found. But it is notorious that such a doctrine is wholly fall fallacious. The nuggets would have exactly the same value, notwithstanding that they were found with greatly different quantities of labor. So when different quantities of wheat mingle in the same market brought from all different countries of the world, their general value is determined solely by the law of supply and demand. But wheat of a superior quality 
bears a higher price than wheat of an inferior quality without the slightest reference to cost of production. We saw in a paper that some wheat from Manitoba was brought into the Liverpool market and it was at once priced 3D per 100 pounds higher than the best Californian wheat. This is due simply to its superior quality and had nothing to do with cost of production. And many other cases of a similar nature might be cited. Four, if labor be the sole cause of value, a thing once produced by labor must always have value and the same value. But this is notoriously contrary to experience because it is notorious that a thing may have value in one place and not in another, and at one time and not at another. As the author of the Erexixius very slowly showed, a bag of sovereigns has great value in London, but take them among the Eskimos and where would their value be? A professor of Greek, Latin, or mathematics may find his acquirements of great value in the universities where there is a demand for instruction. But of what value would they be to him among the Patagonians? A great lawyer finds his knowledge and his skill of great value in the royal courts of justice. But of what value would they be among the Hottentots? Even in London itself, if a man labors very hard to acquire professional knowledge and no one employs him, where is the value of his labor? If a man had all the medical knowledge in the world from Hippocrates and Gelu to Copland and no one was ill, what value would it be uh, to what, what value would it be of to him? If, if an author were to publish the most learned and laborious works in the world and no one would buy them, what value would they be of to him? To say that labor is the cause of value is to say that an isolated thing can have value, whereas value is always relative and can only arise in society. But if a man labors ever so hard and no one will buy his products, he is no better off in London than in the Sahara. If anyone were to set out, if anyone were to set up a manufactory of watches or reclaim land and grow fine fields of wheat in the center of Australia, where there is no demand for the watches or the corn, where would their value be? Moreover, if labor be the sole cause of value, if a thing is once produced, its value could never vary, which is Ricardo's express doctrine. But this is contrary to all experience. Because after things have been produced and all labor upon them has, has been ended, they constantly vary in their value from day to day, from month to month, from year to year. Thus, pictures from one master constantly rise in value, and pictures by another master diminish in value long after the hand which has produced them lies cold in the grave. The pictures themselves remain the same. It is the taste of the public which varies. Ricardo maintains that the same labor in Ricardo maintains that the same labor in manufactures always produces the same value. In the reign of George III, there was a very widespread fashion to wear steel shoe buckles. This manufacturer employed a very large number of persons. All of a sudden, these steel buckles went out of fashion. The demand totally ceased, and the people employed in making them were thrown into the greatest distress. But according to Ricardo, the buckles were of exactly the same value when, they, when there was demand for them and when there was no demand for them. Some years ago, the fashion of ladies wearing straw bonnets suddenly went out, and the manufacturers of them at Luton, Dunstable, etc., were thrown into great distress. But according to Ricardo, the value of the straw bonnets was exactly the same whether there was a demand for them or not. According to Ricardo, if the warehouses of Manchester were groaning with goods, the produce of labor, they would be of exactly the same value whether there was a demand for them or not. We doubt whether the manufacturers of Manchester would acquiesce in this doctrine. Now, with respect to the second order of economic quantities, namely immaterial property, which comprehends all species of labor, one simple question will suffice. If labor is the sole cause of value, what is the cause of the value of labor? 
laborers of all kinds know only too feelingly the bitter mockery of the doctrine that labor is the cause of value, when often, and often it happens, that thousands and thousands of them are only too willing to sell their labor, and there is no one to buy it. With respect to the third species of economic quantities, namely incorporeal property or abstract rights, there are some kinds which are, which are associated with labor, such as copyrights, patents, and the goodwill of a business. But the same remark applies to them as to material objects with which labor is associated, that labor cannot be the cause of their value. If a person bestows an enormous quantity of labor in publishing a work, the law, of course, may give him the copyright. But if no one will buy the work, where is its value? So also of patents. An inventor may bestow enormous labor in perfecting the machine. But if no one will buy the machines made, where is the value of the patent? No person, no persons know more feelingly than authors and inventors that labor is in no way necessarily the cause of value. But there are vast amounts of incorporeal property which have value, which are not associated with labor at all. Thus, a person who held a large amount of the funds would be a wealthy man, and the funds have value. But where is the labor bestowed on them? Mill himself allows that a promise to pay by a solvent merchant or banker is of exactly the same value as the gold itself, which of course it is, because the gold is the value of the promise. But how is the value of the promise due to labor? And the whole mass of circulating credits or debts are of exactly the same value as an equal quantity of gold. How is the value of this mass of circulating credit due to labor? The quantity of this mass of credit in this country is colossal. It far exceeds any other kind of single property in the country except the land. Thus, we see the utter fallacy of the doctrine that labor is necessary to value, and that all wealth is the produce of land, labor, and capital. Results of the preceding inquiry, 12. We may now summarize the results of the preceding investigation. These are, one, that there are vast quantities of property, both corporal and incorporal, which have value upon which no labor was ever bestowed. Two, that quantities produced by labor, both corporal and incorporal, may have no value. Three, that the same quantity of labor may produce products, some of which have value and others no value. Four, that quantities produced by varying quantities of labor have the same value. Five, that things produced by labor may have value in some places and not in others, and at some times and not at others. Six, that things produced by less labor may have greater value than things produced by more labor. From these indisputable propositions, the result of practical experience, the undeniable inference is that labor is not in any way whatever the cause or form of value or even necessary to value. And in fact, in this great commercial country, the enormously greater amount of valuable property is not the result of labor at all. Now, by the laws of inductive philosophy, if we could find a single case of value which was not the result of labor, that single instance would alone be sufficient to overthrow the doctrine that labor is the sole cause of value. But instead of one instance, there are multitudes. In fact, the enormously greater portion of valuable property is not associated with labor at all. In short, there never was any doctrine in science which has received such a crushing and overwhelming overthrow as that labor is the cause of value. And hence that system of economics, which founds its idea of wealth and value on labor is utterly fallacious. The, per, the pertinacity with which some writers still maintain that labor is the cause all of all value, contrary to the evidence of the most glaring facts, is a strong and striking instance of Bacon's alphorism. The human understanding, when it is once adopted an opinion, either as being the received opinion or as being agreeable to itself, draws all other things 
draws all, all things else to support and agree with it. And though there be a greater number and weight of instances to be found on the other side, yet these it either neglects or despises, or else by some distinction sets aside and rejects, in order that by this great and pernicious predetermination the authority of its former conclusions may remain inviolate. But with far more subtlety does this mischief insinuate itself into philosophy and the sciences, in which the first conclusion colors and brings into conformity with itself all that come after, though far sounder and better. Besides, independently of that delight in vanity, which I have described, it is the peculiar and perpetual error of the human intellect to be more moved and excited by affirmations than by negatives, whereas it ought properly to hold itself indifferently disposed towards both alike. Indeed, in the establishment of any true axiom, the negative instance is the more forcible of the two. <laughs>